My background is I'm the CTO and co-founder of a company called um, Critical Blue, which is based in uh, Scotland. Um, my technical background is I've worked a long time in actually compiler technology and kind of code optimization. Um, so making kind of apps go really go fast. Um, and actually, we've done quite a lot of work in um, sort of Android operating system, kind of making the underlying platform faster. Um, so kind of via this route, we, we kind of got involved in looking at the kind of innards of the, of the Android platform. And uh, you know, in the last few years, the company has kind of focused quite a lot on kind of security and security as a service <coughs> um, based, in, um, based on the kind of apps. So the idea is that um, yeah, we really help with customers improving their kind of security posture um, in terms of um, the, the, um, the kind of communication between the, uh, the app itself and uh, the backend API. Um, so if you look what's happened in the, the kind of, um, you know, in the last few years, there's, there's kind of been this kind of um, massive transformation that's happened in terms of uh, uh, the use of APIs um, and their importance to the industry. Um, so generally, what's, you know, generally what you see is that, um, uh, if you see kind of this graph on the right-hand side, there's this kind of been this, this enormous growth in the number of APIs which are, which are actually used. Um, and they're basically used to kind of perform this communication uh, be, you know, between um, organizations and kind of client apps. Um, so there's kind of this growth in kind of mobile first, sorry, growth in kind of API first um, development that, that is going on. Um, and there's kind of this need to secure it. Um, if you look at the kind of taxonomy of kind of different types of uh, APIs, there are kind of private APIs where um, they're basically the API itself isn't published. Um, you know, the, the, it's the, the actual uh, structure of the API isn't published and it's only available to, uh, to, the, to the organization itself. And there are kind of partner APIs where essentially um, um, the onboarding process is restricted. Um, and it's, uh, it's quite, it, it, you know, it's necessary to, to go through a kind of stronger process in order to gain, gain access to the API. And then there is these kind of um, public APIs which are kind of open. Um, and uh, generally all you need is basically to go to a kind of um, website to sign up for an API key. But kind of with this, there's this kind of increasing concern over um, the security of, uh, of APIs. Um, and yeah, they're becoming increasingly an attractive target for attacks. Um, so in terms of the kind of security landscape, um, obviously the underprotected APIs was one of the items that was added um, in the release candidate, at least for the OWASP top 10. It seems unlikely now, you know, given the controversy around it, that it's gonna be in the, in the final top 10, but it kind of indicates that this is actually an area of, um, of importance. Um, of, of growing importance. And if you kind of look at what Gartner is saying, Gartner obviously worked with a lot of companies who kind of um, are going through the process of digital transformation where they're opening up their kind of data in the back end via APIs. Uh, they see this as a kind of important area with, with respect to kind of security. Um, in fact, you know, they go on to say that through 2019, um, you know, the majority of mobile security breaches will be exploiting vulnerabilities in this communication of the app with the server. Um, so we, yeah, as a company, we kind of work in this particular area. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about is generic about APIs, but I'm going to talk particularly about uh, mobile apps and the security risk there. If you kind of look what's happened over the last few years in terms of the journey of uh, complexity in the client, uh, this is really what's, what's been happening. On the left-hand side, you have the kind of uh, old-school traditional model of um, you know, a, a web app, a web backend with business logic and a web backend serving content essentially onto a thin browser um, and uh, not much business, business logic in there and a kind of you know, more defined kind of attack surface. Um, so that's where we've been and where we are now is really on the right hand side, both with kind of mobile apps and also with, um, you know, with kind of single page applications and richer uh, richer client applications like Angular and React where there's a lot more business logic inside the app itself. And the communication is really by 
APIs. It might, might be even, even in uh, rich single page applications, you're making multiple API calls from JavaScript directly. And especially in mobile apps, you know, your communication with the back end is via, via these APIs. And in a sense, these APIs now are kind of reaching deeper into the organization in terms of, in terms of the data they have, and especially the kind of breadth uh, that there is of different APIs. They kind of allow uh, easier reusability and, and uh, using these uh, APIs in new applications, uh, but they represent a kind of broader attack surface. Um, so this is kind of an example. Um, you might have, uh, like a, for instance, a travel booking app where you have multiple um, different types of clients talking to multiple different back-end APIs. So um, it might be that the, you're talking to the APIs directly, um, or you may be going through some kind of API management layer which is kind of proxying the, the requests. But either way, there's this kind of dependency on that, this much broader uh, surface of APIs. Um, so you might, you might have a mix of uh, you know, third-party APIs, open APIs, you might have some internal you know, in, this, in this particular example, you might have like weather mapping APIs, hotel, hire car availability, or you, and, and you may have some internal uh, kind of private APIs in terms of kind of doing user author, authorization. But, but really, it's very broad, and the, and the attack surface is very big, potentially. So I'm going to kind of talk about some examples of, of attacks on APIs, uh, things that have gone wrong, try and kind of uh, bring some themes out, and then I'm going to talk about defense. Um, so, the first one I'm going to talk about is, uh, is well, you, you all heard of it, the, the, the very popular game Pokemon Go. This was kind of launched last um, summer. Um, this is a kind of mobile game, very large number of downloads. Um, and basically it communicates uh, from, from the app to the back end in Google um, over a private API. So it's a kind of interactive mapping game where you can see Pokemon characters moving around in the kind of virtual environment. Um, so when the app was first released, there was actually a feature inside it where you could see um, locally what Pokemon characters were around. Um, but that feature was actually removed by Niantic, the developer, very soon after release uh, because it was kind of in, you know, causing too much uh, server load. Um, so when this feature was released, there was a kind of a bit of a backlash from the community. Uh, and the initial version of the app didn't really have much protection in terms of making sure that only the app itself could make uh, API calls to the back end. Um, and so there was this kind of um, work that went on to basically reverse engineer the API by kind of looking at the requests, um, you know, sort of man in the middle reverse engineering, looking at what the app does. And basically these kind of online maps and open source projects that allow you to spoof requests appeared very soon afterwards. And then there was kind of the, the next step was that uh, Niantic added various protections into the app itself. There were, there were checksums that the app did for all the requests to try and prove that the request was coming from the app itself. But very quickly, the community broke these and then the maps reappeared. So, so really, the, the kind of learning here is that even though this was a private API, um, there's really no such thing as a private API. It's published on the internet. Um, if there is a reason uh, to access it, and the client applications to access it are in the public domain, then it's possible to reverse engineer it. Um, another uh, very recent attack which is related to APIs is the Instagram attack. Um, and so this was related to uh, an API request. So, so in an older version of uh, the Instagram app, um, it was possible, it's possible to go through a password reset function. And that password reset function essentially um, uh, um, makes a request with the handle of the, of the particular user, um, and that API request then returns some additional data, um, in, you know, including personal contact information. But what's actually possible to do is it's actually possible to tamper with that particular API request um, using a kind of man-in-the-middle proxy, put somebody, else, somebody else's handle, like a celebrity, and get contact information back. Um, so poor access control effectively on the, on the API. And then, of course, given that information, you can then lo launch a, a social engineering attack, a very effective one, which allows you to then um, get access, you know, potentially do an account takeover, which, which is what happened in this particular case. And once you have an account takeover, then, of course, all the data can be, can be leaked. 
So there's kind of the need, need to consider kind of legacy functions, uh, legacy APIs, and the possibility of, of request tampering as well in terms of the kind of overall security um, posture. So there are these reverse engineering risks that exist, particularly in mobile apps, but this is this true of kind of uh, JavaScript as well. Um, there are a very wide variety of kind of open source tools. Um, these ones are primarily uh, Android ones, but also for iOS um, that allow you to reverse engineer um, what's happening inside a mobile app. Uh, you can see strings inside it. You can decompile the code. Um, you can actually go as far as actually taking the code, reverse engineering it, adding your own malicious code, republishing it as an app. And then if you're able to kind of socially engineer someone to install the app, then you can then effectively leverage their credentials and do whatever with the data that's, that's you know, available inside the app. So um, yeah, any secrets as well, like API keys or secrets that are used for accessing uh, an API can also be reversed in this manner. Um, the other thing about APIs is that, that really um, all the uh, potential risks that already exist on the web continue to exist in APIs. So all the uh, concerns around injection attacks, cross-site scripting, uh, all these things um, potentially could be inside an API as well. It's still a risk. The way APIs generally are kind of developed is they have a quite a regular structure in order to make it easy to develop against. Um, so it's, with, with a little information, it's, it's relatively easy to guess what other endpoints would be, even if they're not documented, and what other functions might, uh, that might be instantiated. Um, there are kind of other types of attacks, like uh, verb tampering, for instance. So you might take a get request and then turn it into a delete request and see whether that actually deletes the item, which might happen, of course, if there's very poor access control. We would be given being given too much access permission with a particular access token. So uh, the vulnerability scanners which exist in the, in, the, in the web world are not as mature currently as they are in the API world as well. So, so really, you, you can't rely on scanning in this, quite the same way. Um, one of the advantages, though, is that there are more formal ways of, of, kind of specifying an API in terms of using open API standards and, and swagger. Um, which allow you to kind of um, define uh, access control, et cetera. Um, and if you're using kind of automatic code generation, that means that some of the mistakes that might have occurred from, from manual implementation uh, are not there. So there are, there are potentially some advantages in, in, in defining uh, APIs in this way. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about um, the kind of traditional defenses that exist um, for securing APIs. I'm going to talk in general terms, and then I'm going to talk particularly about um, this issue of um, secrets inside mobile apps and how that can be used to uh, attack a particular API. So these are you know, typical layers of defense. Um, you, you have a number of different client applications, uh, mobile apps. You might have server-to-server -server, uh, API communication. It's very typical as well. You might have single-page applications. Uh, all talking, hopefully, over TLS to, um, to a back end, um, where there are various layers in effect. So these are all at the application layer. So in addition to these application layer defenses, of course, you have all the network defenses as well, like firewalls. Um, so you have authentication and authorization of the user. Um, you have rate limiting um, in order to, you know, to limit the, the damage that can be done by making too many requests. And then also, in, in, in many cases, you also have some kind of authentication of the software client itself, um, either by keys or kind of uh, secrets which are used to sign um, uh, requests to prove that it's actually coming from the right, uh, right client. Um, in terms of authorization and authentication, there are kind of well-known standards like OAuth and uh, OpenID, which are, which are used, typically used to implement that. Um, the first thing I'm going to talk about is, kind of, is rate limiting. Um, so the issue with APIs is that you, if, a, if a single user um, or, or group of users makes a large number of API requests, then there is the possibility that that would actually degrade the, surface, the service to other users. Um, so generally, in order to maintain the quality of service and, and to really act as a, as a defense against application-level DDoS, 
um, th yeah, th there's normally a, a rate limiting put in place, which is maybe by uh, the IP address. It could be by an API key, which is, it basically is a, is a rate limit for a particular application, or, or even by a user. Um, ideally, these types of protections should also account for uh, the type of request being made, um, because some requests are a lot more expensive than others. Um, you know, for instance, if, if you're doing a GET request that might be cached, that's potentially not much overhead, whereas if you're doing an API request which invokes a back-end database search, then potentially that is more expensive and you would want to rate limit even more for those um, because those are the type of things that you would look for as an attacker uh, in order to do a DDoS, in order to, to produce high load on the back-end systems. Another thing which um, is important as well is that uh, in, in some cases, data can be scraped off an API. For competitive reasons, you might want to get, say, pricing information off, off an API. And to do that, you might build a, a bot, which basically knows how to access the APIs, and then, then basically exfiltrate the data. And to prevent that, you need to be able to recognize that. Um, so there are various kind of behavioral approaches which are used to prevent it. Um, and also, in the extreme case, you might want to inject some kind of capture. Uh, now, normally captures are for the web world. So, it's, so in general, captures and, and proving that you have a human on the other end is not something which is normally as easy to, to put into a, an API, given it's generally built around uh, JSON and uh, HTTPS. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the OAuth 2 flow here, um, because it's quite important. You see it very widely in terms of uh, APIs. Uh, they normally have a section when you sign up for an API, well, how do you get a token to access each of the endpoints, normally based on this, this standard. Um, it's, it's quite, um, the nomenclature around the, the actors in, in OAuth 2 is, is somewhat complex or, or it, not, not obvious when you first, uh, you first read it. Uh, and also there are a large number of different types of uh, flows that you can use. Uh, and it's not always obvious exactly which flow you should be using in a particular case. I'm going to talk about the code, code ramp flow uh, briefly because that's the most common one that's used with APIs, but there are other types of flows. In terms of uh, what these boxes mean, on the left-hand side, uh, what ref is referred to as the client is effectively the software app. Um, and then you have uh, a resource owner. So the resource owner is, is basically uh, the user, in most cases, in these types of, uh, of circumstances. Sometimes it can be another, another machine for to machine to machine stuff, but, but generally it's the user. And what's happening here is that the idea of OAuth 2 is that um, the resource owner is giving um, delegated authorization to a client application to go and use an API on its behalf. So essentially the client initiates um, the process, talks to the resource owner, um, um, if, it's got, if you have the right credentials, then it's granted from an authorization server, and then an access token is then used to access what's called the resource server. So the resource server is, is effectively the API. So this is the, this is the thing that's got the data behind it you're trying to protect. Um, this is a bit more detail on, on the uh, code grant flow. Um, this in introduces another different agent uh, called the well, a different box called the user agent. And the idea here is that you want to kind of create the separation between uh, the client uh, software and uh, the mechanism that, you, that the user uses to enter their credentials so the client doesn't directly have uh, access to those credentials. So it's initiated by uh, the client, um, basically in general bringing up sort of a login screen on, in the user agent, which is the browser. Um, user submits their credentials, that goes back to an authorization server that has access, obviously, to uh, passwords, is able to validate the credentials. Um, and if they check out, then an authorization code is returned to the user agent, which is then immediately redirected back to the client. And then the client is then able, using its access code that's just got, um, to, to request an access token. In, in some, not all cases, as well as the authorization code, there is also a client secret. So the client secret um, also proves that this uh, conversion into an access token is actually coming from uh, the correct client software. Um, 
If that checks out, it validates, then an access token is, is, is returned. The access token is then good, really, for a, generally a large number of API requests. It's delegated authorization, so it will have certain access permissions associated with it. There may also be a, a refresh token, which enables a new access token to be obtained sometime later. And really, this kind of creates the experience in apps where you sort of log in once, and then you don't really need to log in again for a long time, because an access token and or refresh tokens have been obtained uh, to keep that information, you know, to keep that access for a long period. Um, the key thing about access about, about uh, the access token, though, is that thought needs to go into uh, what permissions that um, a particular access token will give you, um, and that needs to that thought needs to go in at the API level, not at the client application level. Um, it, it might be that the application only uses a subset of, of API endpoints, uh, and you need to ensure that the access token isn't going to give you permissions that you didn't expect on other endpoints, because it's possible, of course, that the access token uh, could be stolen. You know, it, it might be possible to perform some kind of attack on the client device um, to take the access token and then try uh, the use, use of that access, access token against other endpoints. Um, so, so it's important that um, you know, the consideration goes in at the API level. Consider the API level to be the, the attack surface, not the client application itself. It's not about what you can do inside the client with that access token, but what you can do on the endpoints. Um, another thing which is quite important, it depends on the application, is this idea of, of API keys and software identity. Um, so, yeah, as I said, the kind of typical flow is that, uh, you know, for an open API, a developer signs up for an API key. In some cases, it may just be an API key, and sometimes there's also a, a secret which is involved as well. And the idea is that the secret um, d generally is not transmitted. It depends on the implementation. Generally, it's not transmitted. It goes inside the client application, and then the client application can prove it has access to the secret. Um, this is also relevant to Auth2, as I said, because sometimes there's a client secret there, which is basically used as leverage to get the access token. Um, this kind of identifies your application. Now, there are kind of many cases where uh, people have accidentally checked in the API keys or secrets into source code. So that's really bad practice because it could then get uh, published in some forum. So generally, in sort of server to server, uh, the secret needs to be kept safe. It shouldn't go into the source code. There should be some kind of, uh, in the extreme case, a hardware security module or, or some kind of mechanism or, or me method to obtain the secret when it's needed through the environment without actually putting it into source code. So you minimize the risk of it being stolen at rest. Um, if you read a lot of the um, sort of advice in terms of uh, putting secrets into uh, client applications when the client is public, like it's a mobile app or it's a, it's, a, it's a web app, then it essentially says, well, don't put a secret into it because it can be reverse engineered. Um, that's fine and good, but, but the problem is that if you don't have a secret, then your kind of security is entirely reliant on the user uh, authorization and identity. If it's difficult to onboard into a particular application, then, then of course that might be sufficient. But there are cases, and we work with a number of customers where well, this is exactly the case, where uh, the friction of onboarding a new customer is actually quite low, especially in kind of business to consumer type applications. So you really want to have another mechanism to, to prove that it is only the um, uh, correct software application which is trying to use an API, um, in, in addition to user authentication. But, but there's a possibility of abuse of the API um, simply by fake, effectively fake users um, onboarding into the process. Simple API keys tend to be just, well, passwords effectively, random, random strings of characters. Um, it's better to use something like a, a JWT or JWT token uh, as, as a mechanism to do this because it, because it has the advantage of being extensible. Essentially, a JWT token allows you to uh, convert metadata into a base64 string that you can transmit reasonably easily. Um, you can put additional claims in. They can have a lifetime, so they have an expiry time, so you can have good mechanisms to, um, to refresh them. Um, and, they, and the important thing is they can also be signed as well. So this basically proves that they haven't been tampered with. 
Um, so you can't tamper with the expiry time or anything like that. Um, so this is, this, is, this is a good way of transmitting uh, tokens around in a way which is very extensible. Um, now, some applications are, are developed where they, they essentially talk to um, a number of different API providers on the back end. Um, and I'm talking particularly about applications which are running on, on mobile devices. Um, uh, if that's the case, it's better not to um, have any kind of keys for, for each of the API providers that you're using um, built into the client application. It's better uh, to have a single key or a small number of keys, ideally one, in the client application, which essentially leverages those additional keys via some kind of proxy mechanism, either an API management uh, system or, or a proxy, which uh, enables you to, if, if the client app is able to prove that it is the correct client app, it has the correct user authori authorization, um, then it's able to then gain access to the correct API keys or secrets to then make the backend requests. So the advantage of that is you've kind of, well, the disadvantage, I suppose, you've added another layer of, of um, latency, but the advantage is that uh, you don't have to be concerned about the loss of those keys or the reversing of those keys. You can then just worry about the key that you have built in, inside the client application. In terms of uh, keys, there are, there are um, that have been built into apps. There are, there are two kind of um, attack surfaces you need to worry about. There's the attack surface of it being uh, stolen in some way when it's in transit, and also the attack surface of, of reverse engineering. Um, so a lot of the, the um, attacks I've talked about have, have allowed um, information to be extracted via uh, man middle attacks. So on a mobile device, there is something called a trust store, which is, which is effectively um, the set of intermediate certificates that the mobile device actually trusts. Um, and that can be updated by, by a user. So. Uh, if an attacker has, has possession of, of the app and the mobile device it runs on, then they can essentially push their own self-signed certificate into the trust store, uh, push the same self-signed certificate into a man-in-the-middle proxy, um, and that causes the mobile app uh, to then trust that intermediate certificate and then allows all the traffic to be decoded. Um, so this is a risk if there are any kind of uh, secrets or you know, tokens that are being transmitted uh, over this channel that could then be reversed, well, that can be extracted, and then they can be used in some kind of other fake client application. The way you defend against this type of attack, and you know, many uh, more security conscious apps, like banking apps, do this, is that you, you use a technique called uh, pinning inside the mobile app. And what, what essentially that is doing is it's saying, don't trust the, the, the trust store actually bind the API request, uh, well, the, the API endpoint requests to a particular certificate. So either the certificate, a particular certificate or its public key or some hash or, of it is put inside the mobile app directly. And when an when API request is made, if you don't see that particular, um, you don't see that particular API, that particular certificate, um, then you basically reject the, uh, the communication. Um, so that basically prevents these type of man and middle attacks. Um, however, there are kind of two problems with this. Uh, firstly, is that there are various tools which are available. Because these use quite standard interfaces to do this, um, there are tools which are available that you can put onto a routed device, which then enable you to essentially undo this process. Um, and the other problem is that you actually kind of create this dependency between your, your app and your backend servers, and that if, when you want to rotate the certificate, uh, you can't just do that without updating the mobile app. And then you realize, of course, that you can't get all your users to update mobile apps overnight. So then you, then you have the maintenance problem of having potentially two certificates that you need to rotate with a, with a time period in between. So there are a few kind of management issues around it. Um, in terms of actually implementing it on a mobile app, it's relatively straightforward generally. Most of the, the both on iOS and Android, have mechanisms to do this. This particular example is um, for Android um, using OK HTTP layer, where essentially you just create a class where you, where you add certain endpoints and you give it a hash of a certificate you expect, 
And then basically when you make your HTTP requests, um, unless you see a certificate without hash, then it gets rejected. Um, so going beyond, going beyond that, there are kind of some other ways that you can um, defend secrets more strongly in, in apps. I'm going to talk about some kind of general techniques. There are you know, various tools and technologies and vendors in the space. But, it, but in general terms, um, there, are, there is white box cryptography. So as I said, in some cases, what you do, rather than transmit any kind of secret uh, or between an app and the backend API, is that instead you um, uh, send kind of some kind of checksum or some, uh, an HMAC is a typical way. A, a hash message authentication code is a secure way. It basically sends you, sends the message um, and you sign it. You sign the message with a secret key. And basically that proves both that the message hasn't been tampered with in any way and also that you have possession in the app of the secret key without actually transmitting it. Of course, that creates the possibility of being able to reverse engineer, engineer it. So white box cryptography kind of goes further and uh, is a technique where you can take uh, secrets, cryptographic algorithms, and dissolve the secret directly into, into the code. So rather than actually ever have the, the um, secret in memory or, or even in code, uh, it's dissolved into a, into a white box. And then you end up with a function that uh, you can take a message in uh, it will create a, a signature of it that includes includes the secret within the kind of message, uh, the signature, um, which is the way you would typically use it in this type of application. There are various other uses for white box as well. So it's very it's very strong, very difficult to reverse engineer. Although the the, the risk, of course, is that you can take rather than steal the secret, you can steal the algorithm, and you sort of take the the secret out of the the mobile application and then use it somewhere else to actually just sign the traffic for you. Um, another technique is uh, app hardening and, and app obfuscation. Uh, so these are, these are techniques where your, your code is, is obfuscating and make, making it much more difficult to reverse engineer uh, what's going on inside the app, more, more difficult to understand um, how, how APIs might have been implemented. Um, they generally also include some kind of tamper resistance. So any attempt to modify the code that's running in the app will cause it to, to you know, stop working or, or defend itself in some way. And these really kind of provide a, um, an indirect uh, protection on APIs um, in that uh, if you're obfuscating uh, key secrets, uh, algorithms that are used to access an API, then this is an indirect, indirect way of kind of securing them. And then the, the, I suppose the, the most secure way is to use uh, something like Trust Zone. Um, so Trust Zone is, is a hardware feature in, in ARM devices, on, on, which are typically used in mobile devices, which is basically a, a separate enclave that you can run uh, algorithms in, or you can, you, can, you can hold secrets in. And this is, this is secure at the hardware level in the sense that even uh, if you obtain root access on the device, you still can't see what's inside that, that secure area. Um, you can invoke the code in, in that area in certain ways to perform the functions you want to perform, but uh, you, you can't reverse the secrets and you can't see the code. Um, so um, so the, the, the difficulty with that really, it, it's very difficult to extract the information, but also equally because of the same reasons, it's also quite difficult to uh, get the code in there in the first place. So there, there are some complications around how you provision that code and those secrets inside um, Trust Zone, which make it difficult to use generally in, in, in all apps as a way of protecting, um, you know, protecting your keys. Um, and then there are some other techniques. That we do some work in this area, um, and there are other sort of technologies around this, um, which are basically what we're kind of remote attestation of apps. And the idea here is that, you know, in addition to your standard user author authorization, you kind of recognize that there's also this need to uh, be able to identify the, the app itself. Um, and rather than ride, rely directly on secrets, what this does is it takes, uh, uh, it basically does an integrity measurement on the app. So basically an app authorization service initiates uh, an integrity measurement on, on the app, uh, so the code in the app. Um, 
as a kind of one-time measurement. And then basically, if the app is able to, to prove that it really is the app by doing this measurement, uh, then it can be issued with a short-term token, which can allow, then allow it to talk to a, a back-end API server. OK, so, so in summary, really, I mean, APIs have become much more prevalent. They've become the way that services are interacting outside the organization and with microservices inside the organization as well. Um, most of the issues to do with security are, are being carried forward with, with APIs in terms of the risks. Um, you need to be aware that any API which is made available on the internet is essentially public, whether you intend it to be or not. And because protocols uh, can be reverse engineered, and it's possible to build an app which can spoof you know, a bot or another piece of software that can spoof um, API requests. Um, and in some applications where the onboarding process for users is not that strict, especially in kind of consumer apps, uh, there's a possibility that APIs can be abused by, by fake users. And so there's this need to kind of um, uh, to, to, to prevent automation by building uh, different software clients to do that. There's this need to consider user identity and software identity together. Uh, and simply building secrets into apps is really not very good. Uh, they're easy to reverse. So there, there are kind of a number of different levels you can go to in terms of how much security you, you want to implement and how much security you actually need. But you need to make those considerations as well in terms of locking down access to the, to the API. Okay, thank you. <laughs>